Yo, what's poppin' Poke Pals? Rare Boy here, and today we are finally gonna take on an impossible Pokemon challenge in the Johto region. Your boy finally found a program that allows him to edit Pokemon data so I can import Pokemon from future generations into a copy of Pokemon Gold. There is just one problem though. Apparently, there's only one program that edits the sprites of Pokemon in Gen 2, and it's not compatible with my laptop. So all of the sprites you guys will be seeing in our Gen 2 Contender videos, I edited in post. So they won't look as clean as my Gen 3 sprites, but I'm just happy we're able to get these runs going in Gen 2 now. If you all absolutely hate the way it came out, I'll scrap Gen 2 from our game repertoire, but I think it came out fantastic. With that off my chest, we can go over the basics of the run. Today, our Contender is going to be Zoroa in Pokemon Gold. As I mentioned in my last Impossible Challenge, I wanted a Pokemon from the Unova region. And the first two Pokemon that come to my mind when I think of Unova are Zoroa and Zoroar. The other reason I chose Zoroa is that Dark types are not great in Gen 2 unless they have access to the move Crunch, which Zoroa does not. This means while we have the best stats out of all the contenders yet, we can't utilize our Dark typing to the best of our ability, and our move pool is severely limited. Zoroa thrives on setting up a nasty plot and sweeping with Dark Pulse, but with neither of those moves, this will hopefully lead to an interesting run. The first thing I needed to do was edit a Pokemon's internal data so that they become Zoroa. For Gen 2 runs, I'm going to be using Togepi Sprite, since it has a small sprite which is easy to edit over and it's not used by any other trainers, making for the most authentic experience. Since the sprite will be edited during post, I don't have to worry about color schemes like I normally do. Now that Zora was in our game, let's go over the rules of the run. The first rule is I'm only allowed to use Zora in battle. I'm allowed to capture other Pokemon for HM usage, but they cannot assist Zoroa in combat. The second rule is that items will not be used in battle, aside from held items such as leftovers. And finally, there will be no glitches or exploits used in this run, it's just a normal playthrough of Pokemon Go, but with the Zoroa. Now that we got the ground rules and explanations out of the way, Let's finally jump into some gameplay. The first thing I do is pick up Zoroa from Professor Elm's lab. For this run, I replace Cyndaquil with Zoroa so our rival gets Feraligatr, who is his canonical pick. I name our mischievous fox Shippo after the fox demon from my favorite anime series, Inuyasha. I take a look at his stats and moveset, and they're pretty solid for a starter Pokemon. Let's just see how our fox demon fares against the Johto region. After talking to Professor Pokemon and getting our Pokedex from Professor Oak, we're greeted by our rival, who is a clean sweep with our stab pursuit. Nothing to see here, folks. Let's keep it moving. After squealing on that boy with the fire truck hair to the police, I make my way to Sprout Tower for some nice experience to help us take on our first gym. We get all the way to level 13, which seems like a good level to take on Faulkner. After taking out Faulkner's goons, we reach level 14 and cleanly sweep his feathery friends, nabbing us our first gym badge and giving us the TM from Mudslap, which will certainly come in handy for the rest of the run. After saving my Slowpoke boys from the well, we reach level 19 and take on our second gym with Bugsy. Bugsy I was nervous about, being a dark type and all, but because Bugsy made some terrible move choices during the fight, we were able to defeat him on our first try. We can't celebrate for too long though as our rival YouTube actually knocks out Shippo for the first time in this run due to some bad confusion luck from Zubat. With a few more levels we should be able to Oko Zubat and two shot Croconaw. Let's try this again. I came back two levels higher at level 23 and these two levels were exactly what we needed to pull out of victory against our rival. Next up is our favorite gym leader Whitney though so we'll see how that goes. After taking on every last trainer outside of Goldenrod, we take on Whitney at level 28. Clefairy survives our faint attack and retaliates with a weak Comet Punch, as she gets taken out. For Milk Tank, I spin Mud Slaps to ruin her accuracy, and it works! We managed to take down Milk Tank on our first try thanks to all the accuracy drops, and while still being in green health. As a kid, this battle was a nightmare, but now that I'm older, I realize it's so easy to cheese your way through this match. I hope I don't eat those words in a future challenge. 
As one would expect, Mori was the easiest gym thus far. Being a ghost type trainer, he stood no chance against our faint attacks, and we got the TM for Shadow Ball, which is an all around fantastic attack. After such an easy battle, though, we have to challenge Chuck, the fighting gym. Believe it or not, we almost beat Chuck on our first try. We managed to take down Primate with no issues, and just when I thought we were going to win with the crit headbutt, we got a low roll, and Polyrath lived on what looks like 1 HP. He retaliated with a, a devastating dynamic punch, and he o would us. Well, I guess it's time to get a few more levels. At level 50, Primate is now a clean one-shot, and Polyrath is just barely taken down with two headbutts. If we got yet another low roll in this match, he could have easily dynamic punched again. Now it's time for the gym leader I fear the most, Jasmine. Steel types resist dark in this generation, and Mudslap is the best move we have to take them on. Thankfully, her two Magnemites go down to one Mudslap each, so we don't have to worry about paralysis in this match. But, Steelix is the real issue. I went for Shadow Ball turn 1, forgetting that Steel also resists dark in this generation, as he misses his first Iron Tail. Faint Attack deals much better damage, but it still looks like we need another 3 hits to, as we get slammed by Iron Tail. We repeat this turn, the next turn, as Jasmine heals Steelix and we wind up in red health. Thankfully, she misses an Iron Tail and we're able to take her out on only our first attempt. This battle got way too close for comfort. I head straight for Price as I already cleared out the Rocket Hideout in preparation for Jasmine, and this gym was a nice and easy sweep. Piloswine survived in the red and was healed by Price, but he didn't hit hard enough to have me worried. Back in Goldenrod, Team Rocket has taken control of the radio tower, so we head underground to meet up with our rival, who stands no chance against Shippo, who is now at level 57. For Alligator was the only issue, but because the developers gave him such a terrible moveset, I wasn't worried in the slightest. At the top of the radio tower is the Rocket Executive, who despite having two dark types of his own, was not an issue at all. He was a clean sweep. The last gym leader in Johto is Claire, and she always gives me issues. It starts off great Okoing her first Dragonair, but the second one lives in the red, meaning that the first Dragonair was a range KO. She thankfully misses her Thunder Wave, but we don't get so lucky on the third Dragonair who paralyzes us, allowing Kingdra to outspeed and take us out. With a few more levels, we should be able to smoothly Oko her three Dragonairs. At level 67, all the Dragonairs go down to one faint attack, leaving us in perfect health for Kingdra this time around. She doesn't attack us and just goes for Smokescreen, which is useless since Faint Attack bypasses accuracy, so we take her out after she tries to stall us out with healing. At the end of Victory Road, we're met by our rival for one last battle, and he was no issue whatsoever. I mean, look at this. Shippo's just way too strong for him. All that's left now is the Elite Four. Here are our stats just outside the Elite Four at level 70. These are actually pretty solid, and I finally replaced Mudslap with Dig. There's some nasty Pokemon in the Elite Four that are going to need to be hit by a stronger ground type move, and this is the best I can get. Make your final guesses on whether or not you think we can win. Let's find out. First up in the Elite Four is Will, the Psychic type expert, and as you can imagine, we mopped the floor with this team. If the Elite Four becomes an issue because of our current level, I can always farm EXP off of his team. Next up is Koga, whose match was going great until Muck came out. He went for Minimize, avoiding our dig, and poisoned us with Toxic, then landed a Sludge Bomb on us before going down. Last out is Crobat, who survives our hit and gets healed by Koga, but Shippo pulled through and knocked him out before the poisoning could take us out. Yet another close call. Next is Bruno, who is by far the most threatening Elite Four member. Right away I see Shippo is not dealing enough damage against his Hitmontop. He goes for Dig, so I also go for Dig to avoid his hit, and manage to take him down untouched. Next out is Hitmon Lee, who could have been scary, but we landed a big crit and got an Oko on him. Hitmon Chan lands two good mock punches before going down, and next out is Machamp. I go for a flinch with Headbutt, but we don't get it, and we're easily KO'd by Cross Chop. Cross Chop isn't 100% accurate though, so I'll try this again until we either flinch him or he misses. 
A few attempts later and we finally flinch Machamp, allowing us to take him down. Last out is Onyx, who is easily disposed of by a faint attack. Next is Karen, whose Umbreon starts things off by confusing us. We hit ourselves in confusion before snapping out and taking Umbreon down. It's already starting off rocky. Next out is Vileplume, who eats our attacks and paralyzes us with Stun Spore. We're somehow able to take out both Murkrow and Houndoom while surviving on 1 HP, but because of the paralysis, Gengar was able to outspeed and knock us out. If we didn't get paralyzed, we would have won that. Let's run that back real quick. I try this battle again as Umbreon causes less issues this time around, and Vileplume flinches from another headbutt, meaning we don't get paralyzed. From here on out, we bypass the accuracy drop gifted to us from Umbreon, and we're able to sweep through the last three Pokemon. All that's left is the champion, Lance. Just like my last two videos, Lance is causing problems. Thankfully, Gyarados flinched this time around, and we took him out, but then came out Lance's first Dragonite. Just like Claire, his dragons love to paralyze their opponent. The only difference is this time we have a lot more bulk and health to deal with. This is Claire all over again. We're going to have to level up to a point where the Dragonites don't cause any issues. I tried this battle several times. Each time I tried a different strategy, alternating between King's Rock for extra flinches and the Pink Bow for stronger headbutts, but we still can't put down these Dragonites. I've ran through the Elite Four about 20 times now and I still can't beat Lance. It wasn't until level 96 that I could successfully take down all of Lance's Pokemon. I don't think he would have been this big of an issue in this run, but once again, Lance had other plans. I can't believe we had a grind to level 97 to make it to the Hall of Fame, but we all know it's not over yet. There's a whole post game we have to go through, and we have to try our luck at Red. Since the first seven gyms in Kanto are weaker than the Elite Four, I just skip straight to our blue fight. Here are our stats at level 100, and these are solid. Our moveset hasn't changed, so hopefully this will be enough to defeat Red and Blue. Let's find out. Pidgeot goes down to a crit, which I think mattered. Rhydown went down to one faint attack, and Gyarados doesn't get a chance to attack us thanks to a flinch from Headbutt. Arcanine went down to one dig, Executor went down to one faint attack, and finally Alakazam got one shot by Shadow Ball. Well, that was underwhelming. Let's hope Red puts up a better challenge. This is it. The final battle against Red. Pikachu gets dropped by a single attack as his behemoth Snorlax comes in. We unfortunately don't get a crit or a flinch on Snorlax, but we also didn't get paralyzed by Body Slam, allowing us to take him out. Next out is Venusaur, who I go for raw damage on as he sets up the sun. I try for a flinch with Headbutt, but we don't get it and get slammed by Solar Beam. I opted for Dig next turn to stall out the sun and get some health back from Leftovers. Venusaur goes down as Leftover brings us just above yellow, but the sun is still out to help Charizard. I try for a flinch, but we fail as we get incinerated by Flamethrower. On my next attempt, we manage to flinch Snorlax and take him out while maintaining full health. I try to flinch Venusaur, but I didn't get it. I started going for nothing but digs this time around to stall out the sun better. We eventually take out Venusaur and the sun fades as Charizard comes in. Perfect timing. I manage to flinch Charizard with headbutt but my faint attack is just out of a range of a KO as we get slammed by a flamethrower next turn. After leftovers we have 139 HP to take on Blastoise. I go for raw damage and it's a clear 3 hit KO as Blastoise sets up the rain. Just like Venusaur, I try to stall out the rain by going for Dig. When we pop back up, Blastoise lands a devastating surf, but because of leftovers, we survive with 46 HP. We take Blastoise out next turn, and last out is Espeon, who we outspeed and one shot with Shadow Ball, winning us the run. Although this challenge was fairly easy in the beginning, I'm still shocked by how difficult Lance was. We played our cards right though and we were able to take our little fox all the way to Mount Silver and defeat one of the strongest Pokemon trainers in history. I really enjoyed this gold run and look forward to doing more in the future despite having to do more editing than usual. It evens out though since gold version runs much smoother and faster than Gen 3 games. 
For my next challenge, we're going back to Hoenn to find out if it's possible to beat Pokemon Ruby using only a Gumi. So if you don't want to miss that video, be sure to subscribe to the channel, as I post an impossible Pokemon challenge once every 10 days or so. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this video, and share it with your friends, as it helps the channel a lot. Thank you all so much again for watching. This has been your boy Rare Boy, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace! Red, white, and blue, yeah, I love